This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So, as Clive said, I kind of have two things to say before I start. Firstly, that it, although it says I work for Black Culture Archives, I don't work there anymore. Um, I left about a month ago, so please don't run me out of hand. Um, I've also been suffering from a bit of a cold, so if I have to, if I go into a bit of a coughing fit, I'm really sorry. I'll kind of do a corner somewhere. Um, <coughs> My talk in the programme was kind of ambiguously titled Ephemera and Black History. But when I was putting together, putting together my talk today, um, it's more specifically the importance of ephemera in black history. So I'm going to look <coughs> roughly at what is ephemera. So for those of you who aren't that clear, and um, we'll talk a bit about it. A really, really brief history of black culture and archives, trying to condense that down to about five to ten minutes of history. What do ephemera and black history have in common, and then some kind of more tangible, practical uses of ephemera. Um, so yeah. So, what is ephemera? <laughs> it's kind of a really broad umbrella term for a number of different types of documents, and I've brought some examples with me here, so if you want to come up and have a look afterwards, you're more than welcome. And it's, today we're going to talk mainly about printed ephemera, so this kind of stuff. But it can, the, type, the term can also be used to talk about digital ephemera, so things like tweets on Twitter or um, things you might find on Tumblr, some of that could be constituted as digital ephemera and more kind of non-textual stuff. But so today we're talking specifically about printed ephemera. <coughs> the word comes from a Greek definition, and my Greek isn't that great, so it kind of comes from epi, which means about on or about, and hemera, which means about a day. And it can be kind of exemplified by this image of the mayfly, which um, is kind of scientific names, ephemera vulgata. And so mayflies are supposed to only live for about a day, they live their whole lives in a day. So that kind of sums up ephemera basically. It's material that is only supposed to last for one day with really kind of very specific um, things in mind. In terms of um, the heritage world, which are museums, libraries, and archives, it also can be described as minor and transient documents of everyday life. And throughout the, my talk today, I'm going to try and argue that it's neither minor nor transient, and it's actually really important, particularly when we deal with them, excuse me, <coughs> deal with black history. So, um, as I said, it can be difficult to describe. So the kind of things that might look at ephemera are leaflets, posters, postcards, so some of the stuff um, that you see in this slide, which are um, material from the Black Women's Movement, uh, courtesy of the Black Doctor Archives, where I previously worked. So you can see uh, in the picture, you can see leaflets, you can see some um, journals, and um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, so one of the reasons why I'm talking about it today is that it often is difficult to, to um, or museums, libraries, and archives, they don't really collect it in a kind of coherent way. Uh, libraries don't really collect it. The larger libraries, like the British Museum, British Library even, do, but um, in the 1930s, they got rid of quite a lot of their ephemera because it didn't fit within the classification scheme that they had um, established. There are some large ephemera collections, but on the whole, libraries don't really collect them. Um, museums, they, they do, and again, it mainly for kind of the intrinsic design value and archives, which I'm going to talk about specifically today, <coughs> they don't tend to collect ephemera because, because one of the main tenets of archiving, that things should be unique, that they should be things like letters, minutes of meetings, correspondence, that kind of stuff. The ephemera doesn't really fit very easily within that. One of the things about archives is that it's supposed to be material that's generated as we, as individuals, as part of organisations, go about our day-to-day -day business. So the fact that something like a leaflet, like this, is consciously produced for a really specific reason that can cause some tensions within archival collecting specifically. So hopefully we kind of are working towards a kind of vague definition of what ephemera is. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of black culture archives. Um, <coughs> so one of the things that has already been mentioned this morning, and that's the 1981 um, uprisings. So 
Black Hawks Archives can trace its development to around 1981 with the disturbances on the streets, which were themselves a combination of quite a number of different issues, particularly policing, things um, like stop and search and discuss at the time, but also um, educational issues. Um, excuse me. <coughs> So, in 1971, a book which some of you may be familiar with came out, it was published by Bernard Cord, called How the West Indian Child Has Made Education Something More in the British School System. And this book highlighted some of the issues that um, predominantly black children were facing in the 1970s, partially to do with the curriculum, which, if it did mention black history at all, it was very stereotypical, very racist. That coupled with the kind of institutional ways of education to kind of put a lot of children and to label them as ESN, so education is abnormal, meant that quite a lot of black children weren't able to reach their full potential. <coughs> so leaving school with very few qualifications, which once you leave, you can't get a job, which was further made difficult by the recession of the late 1970s. So all these issues kind of culminated in the uprisings of 1981 and Quite a lot of the black community galvanised around these issues to create an organisation such as Black Culture Archives. So, um, <coughs> Len Garrison, on your right, left, right, right. So your left. your left. <laughs> tried so hard. <laughs> Him. <laughs> um, he was. Uh, he was originally from Jamaica, so uh, he was an educationist, um, a keen activist, and historian. And prior to um, co-founding Black Culture Archives, he was involved in a project called the African Caribbean Education Resource Project, or ASA for short. Again, some of you may be um, <coughs> familiar with this project. And he wanted to create multicultural education resource packages for, um, for, for school, <coughs> particularly in London, to teach positively about black history. And again, which we've kind of spoken about, we've heard a little bit about today, he found it quite easy to find a lot of American material, so people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Brilliant though they are, um, it doesn't really speak to the British experience. So he kind of really tried to find <coughs> evidence of black experience in the UK. Um, so he was kind of having these ideas in the 1980s when he met Queen Mother Moore, um, who was a, came to the UK in 1982, and she was brought over by an, an organisation called Tree of Life. And she was on a lecture tour in the UK speaking about her idea, which was the African People's Historical Monument Foundation in America. <coughs> and she wanted to produce a place where black history, US black history, could be spoken about in a really positive light, um, an educational and technical facility where people, um, African Americans, could learn really positively about their history. Um, and so she came to the UK, met with Len, and their ideas fused together to create the African People's Historical Monument Foundation, which is the Black Culture Archives' official charity title. So in kind of reference and reverence to Queen Mother Moore, that's the name of the organisation that it trades <coughs> as a Black Culture Archives. So this is um, the original building on um, Carl Harbour Lane in Brixton. Um, I don't know, some of you may remember, remember it. So it was there for about 20 years, from about 1982 to about 2000. And this is where quite a lot of the bulk of the original collecting happened. Um, one of the key aims of Black Culture Archives has always been to create a physical place, a monument for black history, where people, um, black and white, could come to learn about black history. And to, um, yeah, <laughs> and to show the kind of continuity and to some of the ideas that we're speaking about today, to put black history firmly within British history. It's not something that kind of sits outside of, of history. It's, it's um, deeply embedded. Um, <clears throat> I also kind of want to argue that one of the reasons why ephemera and black history are kind of similar, relating back to my earlier definition of mind and transient, is the place that black history has had within the academy, so the historical <coughs> academy, black history itself being seen as minor and transient, which is completely not true. <laughs> um, this is the new building in Brixton. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to go down and see it. So I was there at the opening on the 24th of July, and I was deeply overwhelmed by how many people turned up. It was such an amazing day, which just shows how important buildings like Black Cultural Archives are, and, to, and how important things that we're doing today 
kind of open up discussion to speak about black history, not only what it means to us now, what it meant to us in the past, but also what it, what it is going to mean to us in 10, 20, 30, 100 years from now. Um, sorry again. <coughs> um, going back to ephemera, one of the reasons why I think ephemera is quite important is that it also links to um, an, an idea of something called history from below, and I think we had heard some mention of it earlier. And that is... Oh, that's all right. Um, um, this is what ephemera looks like in the context of Black Hawk Lives. Um, so quite a lot of the early collecting rested on the material that Len was, um, was doing by himself, but also with huge support from the community. So although I said at the beginning he found it kind of difficult to find material, that's not too true. Once he started looking, it was everywhere. He found it in antique shops, people donated the material, and he found it just kind of easy to, to find in black history, particularly around um, the British experience. So within Black Cultural Archives' collections, in addition to being ephemera in collections, there's also something called the ephemera collection, um, which is made up of material like this. So, um, cultural and also political material. Um, <clears throat> it do documents a huge array of material from the 1960s to the 1980s. And one of the things that's really important about ephemera is that it gives us a really interesting glimpse into things that are happening at any given time. So this kind of history from below, <coughs> that, um, oh, we're going to talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> it shows that there's a whole array of what was going on. Um, History from Below was kind of coined by this gentleman, Raphael Samuel, in about the 1970s. And he wanted, he was part of what the History Workshop Movement, and he wanted to kind of spearhead history, not about politi politicians or kings or queens, but about everybody. So people like me, people like you. Um, <clears throat> which now comes under the umbrella of social history. And when you think about it now, it might not seem that radical, but at the time, it was a really, really radical thing to do. Everyone in the historical academy is very much still interested in kings and queens, but to, for people to come and say, we're not interested in kings and queens, it was kind of <laughs> unusual at the time. Um, so one of the things that he suggested was the collection of things like oral history. So Adrian spoke about oral history in his, in his talk. Um, he also spoke about um, family history and genealogy, and that's being important. He also spoke about um, collecting etymology and folklore, novels, songs, poems, visual material, and photographs, which, um, similar to what Renee would have been speaking about if she was able to make it. Um, all of this now comes under the term um, of ephemera within kind of um, museums, libraries, and archives. So you can see how hugely important that kind of material is for telling um, history about everybody. <coughs> At the same time that uh, Raphael was spearheading his history workshop movement, um, Archivists were still very much concerned with this kind of material. So the kind of material they were used to, so some of these are medieval documents. So you've got illuminated manuscripts on the right and rolls on the left. Um, <clears throat> and these kind of new modern records that were being created, they weren't really that sure about what to do with them. And when they were sure about it, they still collected them much more than the kind of important people rather than um, whole communities. And it wasn't really until the 1990s that um, archives became interested in diversity <coughs> that, kind of, um, that comes up. So um, many communities who had previously been excluded from the historical record decided to take matters into their own hands. So places like Black Cultural Archives, other um, LGBTQ community histories and women's um, groups started to collect their own material, started to tell their own history from their own perspective. And again, that's why ephemera is so important because it's kind of one of the tools that <coughs> is used to do that. Um, and as I said, it kind of what's really important about the moment is it gives you this insight into what's happening at any given time, and it's not about the government telling one kind of history; it's, it's two two sides of history, um, which can be demonstrated in this um, project, which I was kind of involved in when I first started at that cultural archives. So I don't know how many of you have seen this that plays on there before, but it was the <coughs> National Theatre. Um, had done a project for over about two or three years to kind of
collect together as much material relating to like plays and playwrights and theatre companies, particularly in the 70s and 80s. And quite a lot of material was found in the ephemeral collection at that cultural archives. And when the researchers were doing the research, they were so excited about it. And I only just started, so I knew that there was this ephemeral collection, but it was just lots of boxes I wasn't really sure about. But once they started opening the boxes and kind of explaining, oh, this is so important, this is so amazing, this is so interesting, that you really kind of get a sense of, of how important this material is. Um, particularly relating to cultural events like theatre and um, dance, when the event itself, the dance, the production, that, that's, that's the end in itself. Um, sometimes companies don't really have the space or the time to think, oh, let's document every single minute, every single meeting that we've been to, but things like leaflets and posters can give a really good sense of what was going on and provide crucial evidence because that might be the only thing that ever ever exists. So I would strongly recommend that you have a look at this, uh, this website, it's very interesting. I think it's www.blackplaysarchive.org or something. If you just put it to Google, you'll find it. <clears throat> I also wanted to show this film. I'm not sure if the sound is going to work. No. <laughs> Has it got a cross next to it? That's not the question. Waiting students in London now have a club of their own, opened by Princess Margaret in Tentacle. Chatting with students, the Princess recalls her own recent visit to their home country and the hospitality and friendliness she found there. She tours the club, which cost £20,000, provided by the West Indian government, and examines Caribbean handicrafts. A fine centre for London's welcome guests. I find the last sentence kind of interesting, but we're not really looking into that to be for a really long time otherwise. Um, <clears throat> but one of the ways that I came to the West Indian Student Centre, West Indian Students Union, was by reading an article by someone called David Clover, who works at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And he had written an article about the West Indian Students' Union. And although the article itself is very fascinating, because he um, said it's very interesting, from an archival point of view, what I found particularly interesting about it was how he, he got to piece the history together. And he, in writing his article, had said that he'd found mention of the centre in um, the papers of uh, C.R. James, which is somewhere held here, which we've already um, spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, and he found it in this uh, report called the West Indian Students' Union's Commission of External Affairs in 1963. And in trying to find out more information about this centre, he, he couldn't find it. Um, all the records are lost, as far as I'm aware. There are no official records of the um, centre. But he was able to put together a really interesting story by the kind of traces that the, the, the kind of archival traces that have been left through ephemera by visiting other organisations such as the George Cameron Institute um, and in Lincoln Park. So one of the things about Ephemera is that it offers a really interesting breadcrumb trail through history for us to kind of be able to piece together certain histories that may otherwise be lost. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, oh dear. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, one of the important things about Ephemera is that it helps us to engage in co-production of history. So it's not just about one set of people, mainly the government, telling us about our history, it's everyone being involved in telling our own histories. Um, and it helps us to capture all aspects of the community, it's not just the important people, it's everyone and how everyone comes together to, to create a community. And just in final conclusion, I would just have us all think about the kind of ephemera that we might have at home. So things like leaflets and postcards, if you're sentimental you might collect everything, um, not your collected anyway, and how um, that kind of material, if you donate it to an archive, how that might help future historians, <laughs> don't be frightened, it's okay, um, how future historians might reflect on, on our lives now so that our story gets captured and it's not just people who kind of might push themselves forward and say, no, this is definitely how it was, don't listen to me. Thank you. <laughs>